is up everyone welcome back to my youtube channel today we will be reacting to a documentary called champions which is on mario andretti um one of you has requested this video i don't think i've done any videos on mario andretti yet so i'm looking forward to getting into it anyway but before we get into the video make sure you subscribe over half of you that watch my videos aren't subscribed just hit the bell it takes two seconds and if you'd like to become a member on this channel and receive exclusive perks you can also do that by hitting the join button down below Around the world, ask anybody, you know, who is, who is the greatest American racing driver. I, I, I think 90%, literally, of the people around the world would say Mario Andretti. Fair. It's a good answer. <laughs> you know, but you know what? The heck with it. You know, it doesn't really, uh, at this stage, you know, I think uh, I, I wouldn't have changed. I wouldn't change anything. Mario was always... I love that. You can look back on it and go, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the way it went and I wouldn't want to change anything. During the war, uh, as a kid, what I remember is that uh, there was a lot of confusion, like a, a lot of unrest, you know. Uh, how do you feel that as a kid, when you see your parents, like uh, your mother cries more than she should, or there's a lot of political argument? That's got to be so weird if your, like, first memories are from the war. Good. By 1948, Gigi had no choice but to move to a displaced persons camp in Lucca, Italy. It was a temporary arrangement that lasted for seven years. Seven years. I got chills. We lived in a uh, room uh, perhaps the size of uh, uh, three of these offices over here. Seven families. Seven families and we, and we were only separated with the army blankets. Despite these conditions, the boys managed to find hope. It came in the form of Italian motor racing hero and champion, Alberto Ascari. <laughs> in September 1954, Mario and Aldo Andretti went to the Italian Grand Prix at Monza to see their idol. It was an event that would change their lives. Probably the most important event as far as my formative years, as far as uh, determining uh, uh, or de defining uh, something for me. Um, the, it's hard to explain. It's almost impossible for me to explain what I really was feeling in those days. I mean, I, I had such a draw to something like that. I mean, it was, I don't think there was anything else in life that you could have presented to me in any possible way to say this could be better. This is it. I mean, this gave me the definite, as Alberto Ascari, this, that's what gave me the, the definite direction, the focus. Uh, and I think that's so crazy how, like, a person can be so, like, latched on to one thing and then they make it their everything. I think it's the most beautiful thing when, like, humans get so passionate about something and don't stop till they get what they want. Like. It's beautiful. Like I said, it goes back where uh, how much even kids, you know, I was 14 years old, you could see this thing, you could see that effort, you know. That, like, no racing gear, cars crazy. So that's the inspiration, you know, that uh, it was so clear. The boys wanted to stay in Europe, hoping to race one day. But the family had to get out of the refugee camp, and this led them to America, where an uncle lived. I was going to say... Did they move to America? <laughs> Following a three-year wait for visas, the Andretti family finally arrived at a small... Three-year wait for visas. Mental. Freddie Adams was a track champion, and I think it was... Well, I was trying to pass him, you know, and he should have been, obviously, just happy to be there, qualifying, just right. And, and, and I was trying, you know, I was trying to just... Hang on, you know, a couple more laps. And I remember seeing Mario trying to slow me down. And all of a sudden, I look on the back straightaway coming out of turn two, and I hit the fence. Oh, my. That thing flipped for, you know, for a long time. Oh. I mean, that car just went end over end. It must have knocked me out very early because I don't remember anything. I uh, don't remember. Wow. Just lose. These pictures are crazy. Immediately, he was uh, in a coma, and... Taken to the hospital, he was... Uh... The fact that they still have, like, pictures for these and everything is insane. I said, what happened? Oh, it's a hat for you. I said, oh, man. I said, we're racing, you know. And it was, at that point in time, see, 
I knew that my dad knew we were racing. And the first words that he told me, that he spoke to me, he says, he said, Marius, I'm sure glad you had to be the one to face the old man. He said those, and uh, that was the best thing I could have. I love that. That's, that's the first thing he said. Clearly. So I figured, well, I'm glad, th I'm glad that I'm in the hospital. You can't touch me. <laughs> Back. For his part, Gigi eventually, if reluctantly, accepted his son's racing careers. Unlike his brother, Aldo never graduated to Indy cars. Instead, he was content to compete in sprint cars and midgets and finally oh. retired from racing in 1969. Love that, though. They both didn't want to do the exact same thing. They went to, like, different um, areas of motorsport. So, in 1961, Mario began to race midgets. Oh, so he went into midgets. In Annapolis, but he lacked financing. My wife, Deanne, had to go to work, and in fact, every penny that she was earning, I was using. Deanne Andretti yeah. worked in a garment factory. It didn't really bother me, because I always just gave him my check home anyways, so uh, that's the way he used it, and um, uh, the only thing that did bother me is when I did quit my job, I was eight and a half months pregnant, and he says, why did you quit? Because I'm about to pop, that's why. That's crazy. You're still working at eight and a half months pregnant. And he said, why did you quit? <laughs> Jim McGee has worked in CART and USAC for about 35 years. He was with Andretti for his first race in 1964 and for his last in 1994. Wow. They were with each other for like 30 years. Practice in that car and we qualified fourth. For a guy that had never, never been there, I mean, uh, right behind Clark. He qualified fourth through the first race he did. Competitive uh, by finishing third in the race. And Firestone signed him to a contract uh, for a million dollars over like five year period. So he went from uh, somebody earning 200 bucks a month to a millionaire in a matter of six months. Two months later. Wow. His life really just like turned a corner. <laughs> He was forced to change his driving style and really slide the car through the corners. It's not normally my style to drive loose or, or weird like that, but uh, but the car stuck. I, I, f I had a feel for it, and I hardly had to turn left to go in the corner. I let the car just roll in and then correct. And I had some guys follow me, spook. That's why I had to go for a lead, a hook or crook. If there were three or four cars, I mean, that car, I was all over the place. <laughs> so I had to just kind of dive and, and, and dive to the inside. I mean, I love that he's able to recall like every race like it was yesterday. I had to drive so aggressively. And, and you know, that part, I think, is I said, worried some guys, you know. Uh, Richard said, hey, he said, we just, we figured, no way you're going to be there at the end. I said, well, that's fine. That's good. As long as I got your message. <laughs> the 12 Hours of Sebring is one of the great endurance races of the world. Andretti won it three times. His three times. Not once, not twice. Three. What? <laughs> the good thing about it is, even though, like, from 70 to 75 or 6, uh, the my IndyCar, uh, you know, winnings were, were not that good because, you know, cars were really junk. Uh, and... Uh, still, I had other things that I was doing, you know, in, like I said, I do a lot of sports car race. So I was always winning something, you know, in some area or on, on the dirt or whatever. Love that, though. He wasn't just doing one sport, wasn't afraid to do all of them. And while he was potentially, like, losing in one, like you just said there, he was winning in another. Killed climb. Oh, need a Pike's Peak as well. For the next six years, Andretti was an occasional Grand Prix driver with various teams while continuing to concentrate on his champ car career in the States. Despite his part-time status, Andretti won the South African Grand Prix in 1971 driving for Ferrari. Mm -hmm. It was only his 10th Formula One Grand Prix race. Drive only his 10th, and he won it with Ferrari. Ferrari, somehow you knew how much I loved uh, driving and how much I loved what I was doing. And he sensed that, and, and that's when he, he, he sort of warms up. He always warmed up to drivers that, that did that. 1974 was a transitional year for Andretti. He drove in many series, searching for direction. By the end of the year, he'd found it. He would become a full-time Formula One driver at Here we go.
The 1976 Lotus was not competitive. It was a slug, you know, really slow in a straight line, didn't have, a, you know, much aerodynamic. But things changed very quickly. Andretti and Chapman had a chemistry that inspired each other and rallied the Lotus team. Their skills complemented each other's. Andretti's renowned abilities as a test driver were never more valuable, and Chapman was able to interpret Mario's technical feedback and implement changes to the race car. Their reward was pole position and victory at the last Grand Prix of the 1976. Wow, so they managed to turn it around. Two had met for breakfast. That Just 12 races after they met for breakfast. That's incredible. His best drive in Formula One. The next year, Chapman designed an innovative car which created high levels of aerodynamic downforce by means of ground effect, a concept new to Formula One. But what we were lacking desperately is straight line speed. A lot of people don't realize actually uh, how hard we really had to drive because uh, if we didn't corner. Yeah, because Chapman created that, didn't he? Like the ground effect aerodynamics. And then a couple years later, they aborted it because they said it was too dangerous for Formula One. And then they obviously bought it back recently. Even though the two were competing for the most prestigious prize in international motor racing, Andretti's and Peterson's friendship flourished. When you respect their ability, you can only admire them. And then if the, the person is a decent person, honest person, then, uh, you know, then you just develop that uh, strong relationship that's sincere. And it... Oh, I love that. So they were, like, fighting against each other, but they had a good relationship with each other. A relationship. It's Whenever it's implied, it kind of burns me up because it's really unfair, actually. And Ronnie would back me up if he was... So, like, even on and off the racetrack, he was a great guy and person. The duel never materialized. Ronnie Peterson crashed on the first lap, a victim of another driver's mistake. Oh. Both his legs oh were my crushed. God. Oh, my God. That's crazy. Both his legs were crushed. Look at all that fire. Andretti had won the championship he had dreamed of his whole life at the very track where he had first watched his boyhood hero race. But for Mario, there was no joy. Yeah. A somber Andretti crossed the finish. Can't imagine how bittersweet that must have felt. But was disqualified for a dubious jump start. Numbed by Peterson's accident and injuries, the team didn't bother protesting. It's, again, it's one of those times when you say why you know why does life have to be so unfair certain times and this was one of them you know it um uh had, should have been the happiest day of my life tragically ronnie Aww. peterson died later that night a victim of what some said was inadequate medical treatment i'm gonna cry <laughs> Uh, should have been a world champion. He fits the category. Um, uh, I, you know, it's just like uh, the tragic uh, losses of all time, no question, the tragic waste. Uh, first of all, you know, his injuries should not have been life threatening and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, again, uh, I would have enjoyed seeing him uh, win a world championship. He deserved it. He was that type of guy, a guy who could win. He had that quality, and um, and as a friend, I would have loved to, you know, to have been able to grow old with him. Oh, I'm gonna cry. We were having a problem with my fuel pickup. We weren't picking up like the last seven gallons in the tank, so we knew we were gonna be in trouble come the end of the race. Two laps or so from the end, uh, I started to get some screams from uh, from my team manager. He says, uh, "Hey," he said, "Michael is having some fuel pickup problems." So then I really stood up on a seat, you know, so now I have a shot at it. Coming off the last corner, I stood, I looked and I saw Dad and Little Al in my mirror because they were racing for position. I was really upset I couldn't pass Mario. That was my big thing, you know, and, and uh, I had been working him for a long time, several laps, and I was just right there. Come off the last corner, I thought I was okay, and all of a sudden the engine just hesitated. And that's when it got yeah. bigger and bigger. And and I had to run at him and run at him. And I saw Michael on the side going slow. And I went, oh, man, this is going to be close. And then it kicked in again. Then it was a drag <gasps> race. And, and he just beat me by, you know, a matter of inches. Oh, no way. Uh, 
And I mean, it was like this far. At that point, I, we didn't even know really who won the race um, because it was that close. Because of the momentum, I thought that I, you know, I felt that I won, but I wasn't really sure. And then when we came in, it was just like, it was a killer, you know? Certainly, he deserved to win, no question, but... Uh, you just had to take it away from him. <laughs> but I knew that that race, being on Father's Day and having Dad beat me in the closest race ever, that that was going to be one race to remember for the rest of our lives. Yeah, definitely. On Father's Day as well, it's quite cute. Approached his 50th birthday. The victories came less frequently, but he remained competitive and was always a threat to win. At the 1991 Milwaukee 200, Michael, Aldo's son John, and Mario made for an all Andretti podium. Wow, all Andretti podium. That's beautiful. Then came the 1992 Indianapolis 500. It was a day the Andretti family will never forget. First, Mario hit the turn four wall and. <gasps> oh no! Then Jeff crushed his legs after a head on collision, also in turn four. But there was still hope. Michael was dominating the race, all the while asking for constant updates on the condition of his brother. Did he, did he win? Ask him, what, how's Jeff, how's Jeff, you know, and they just weren't telling me, and I knew that that was not good, and, and so, very difficult to keep my concentration, but what kept me going was, I'm gonna win this for him, you know, and, and then, oh. you know, 10 laps to go, the engine, the belt on the front engine broke. Oh my, are you kidding? Terrible day. Heartbreaking. I thought there was a low, part of uh, my career, low part of my life, primarily because of uh, Jeff's injuries. And, um, and then the fact that Michael, you know, was so strong and he was denied that, you know, that win. And um, he deserved it so much. Oh, bless. This would take a different turn one year later. Determined to win in his fifth decade of racing, on April 4th, 1993, Mario Andretti won at the Phoenix International Raceway. Of course. It was his 52nd and final Indy car victory. 52nd. Hired from Kart the next year. But he left with the all-time closed course record for speed when he qualified for the 1993 Michigan 500 at 234 miles per hour. 234 miles per hour. Wow. It's the 24 hours of Le Mans. But don't be surprised if he makes a bid to win it someday. <laughs> the Mon program still be, becomes an option when I'll be 86. That'll still be an open option for me. So uh, at this point, I'll never officially retire uh, from any phase of the sport anymore. Um, I'll just... Well, you never know. If, what He's born in like 1940. What's that, 84? Catch Adretti in it. One one car, eight four years old. So beautiful. Um, <laughs> I don't know what other word. If I had to use one word to describe that, it would be beautiful because, obviously, I know about um, Andretti and like his success and everything. But actually, sitting there and watching the footage and even pictures from like all the way back to his childhood um, was crazy. I don't have any other words for that. That was like the one of the best documentaries I've watched in a long time. So yeah, thank you to um, the people that requested this video. And with that being said, if you have any other videos that you'd like me to react to, drop them in the comments and work on my way through everybody's suggestions at the moment. If you did want to check out any of my other socials or become a Patreon member and get early access to videos like this, then you can do all of that down below. And if you want to become a member on this channel and receive exclusive perks, you can also do that by hitting the join button down below. But I hope you enjoyed today's reaction and I will catch you next time for the next one. Bye.